Hello, everyone. Welcome to Prognosis, Episode 3. Um, this time, uh, JM uh, will not be here. He is uh, currently focusing on real-life uh, uh, situations. So, for the time being, I will be hosting um, this podcast. Today, we will have a very special guest, Tim Osman, from the IPS, Infinite Plane Society. Um, and after a conversation we had, um, the idea came up uh, for us to do a few a series of conversations uh, about symbols and about um, the deeper structures of reality and how they connect to the mind, the soul, the spirit. Um, so um, let's start with this. We uh, will probably begin with um, a bit of a conversation about some of the major arcana uh, focusing on the Rider weight deck of the tarot. Um, so, hey, Tim, welcome to Prognosis. Yeah, thank you for having me on. And this is a subject that comes up quite a lot when we're discussing the regular news, because as people who pay attention notice, there tends to be a lot of uh, what you consider to be occult symbolism and subtext. And much of the symbolism can be traced, I, I believe, to the backbone of Western occultism, the Kabbalistic tree of life, and all the associations that go into it. And these have all been correlated with the modern tarot deck. And the cards all have quite a lot of explanatory value in teaching symbolism. And um, for me, it's been very useful to point at these cards to help, I think, understand what's being communicated. Because even though we're talking about the regular news, it's worldview formation. And it seems like they're not just brainwashing us psychologically, but I think there's some kind of a spiritual confusion that they're also sowing. So I'm looking at this as symbol literism, uh, literalism, or sorry, um, uh, symbol literacy, literacy. literacy. Yeah. Like yeah. we have to be mm -hmm. able to read this language or it will be used over our heads. And historically speaking, you see that the poor, the masses are always left illiterate when compared to the elite. Yes, I agree. And uh, even uh, yesterday, um, something came up um, when I was watching a, a movie it wasn't a very serious movie or anything like that, but um, there was a, a character there that used a pendant um, in the shape of a sword, sort of like a claymore, uh, you know, those Scottish uh, kind of swords. And uh, it had, since the, the claymore was uh, with the point um, downward, uh, it looked like a crucifix, but it wasn't exactly a crucifix. And uh, that reminded me uh, that I had uh, actually um, in my uh, teen years, um, bought one such uh, items, and it was uh, a Celtic um, uh, sort of pendant um, identified as the Sword of Luke. Now, Luke, uh, I checked, and uh, is clearly, if one checks the correlations, a sort of a reiteration of Jesus Christ, because he is seen as uh, a warrior, so he defeats uh, the, the, the devil, let's say, which is Balor in the uh, Irish myth. Um, he is seen as the savior that came to save uh, the world from that evil. Uh, he is seen also as the king, uh, and of course the correlation there with Jesus Christ, even Christ means the anointed one. Um, and he was also seen as the craftsman, and Jesus is the carpenter. So these symbols uh, all come from a, a sort of an archetypal pool, right? Uh, and they are just basically recycled and used uh, in different contexts, but at their essence, uh, there is a core that remains uh, stable. Um, and they have, I think that this is used uh, exactly so that there is a connection inside our, our psyches that, that really uh, is able to um, sort of read into this in a in a subconscious level i would say no oh yes and and these are updated and recycled i would say they are going through iterations and a key term that i use here is syncretism where mm -hmm. these are being amalgamated onto existing bodies of symbolic language and motifs and updated for example everyone has seen more or less star wars well mm -hmm. darth vader dark father is saturn Lord of the Night, and Luke Skywalker is the sun, light, and it's about this archetypal battle between light and dark. But when you really get into the detail, Luke losing his sword hand, well, the sword, the lightsaber, would symbolize 
the phallus of Osiris, which gets chopped off when he's hanged. And what happens to Luke? He hangs on a cross mm -hmm. in Cloud City before he has his hand reattached or his sword hand, which symbolizes having his member replaced, which is intrinsic to the myth of Osiris's death and regeneration or reiteration. So this is just an example where they have updated these ancient myths and put it into our science fiction paradigm seamlessly. Oh, yeah, yeah. Although it wasn't one of the uh, chosen arcanas, uh, now that you touch upon it, we could actually start with the hanged man. Um, since you, you mentioned that scene in, uh, in The Empire Strikes Back, I believe, um, and the hanged man, uh, that where basically the figure is um, doing a, a cross leg kind of thing, like a figure four, uh, and is hanging upside down, uh, and basically is obtaining enlightenment. This is a, a, a myth that is well known in uh, Norse mythology, where Odin uh, was hanging upside down to discover everything about the universe, right? Um, what is your uh, particular reading on that one? Fascinating card. You know, it really is. Because, yeah. um, and a lot of people in the truther realm would mention this because the falling man on 9-11, which interestingly enough, you know, the falling man looks like he's doing the hanged man pose on 9-11. That photograph was taken by the same guy, Richard Drew, who photographed RFK as he was falling mm -hmm. to his death 33 years prior. And then last year, a 33-year-old actually fell into the 9-11 Ground Zero viewing pool. And before he fell in, his legs were crossed like the hanged man. And so people have yeah. looked at this, and it's a fascinating symbol. Um, on, on, on the level of, I think, the aspirant learning the symbols, it might mean something to the effect of, to understand this realm, you may have to invert everything that everything is upside down, you like Alice in Wonderland. Mm -hmm. It's about a change in perspective, which is a huge part of it. There's also, I like this card because it, it, I think it kind of suggests suspension of judgment, um, not reacting immediately to the world, a pause. There's a, a few meanings there. And then, of course, you have the obvious reference to Christ, who's going through a hanging period, which is then followed by a rebirth, a new perspective, a higher perspective. Yes, and it could be argued as well uh, in the relation to 9-11 that 9-11 uh, was uh, when the twin uh, towers, um, you know, the, the Yakim and um, Boaz, uh, were taken down uh, to obtain that enlightenment. Um, and therefore, the hanged man was falling from the, the towers being taken down, which also links then to the tower tarot card um, that, um, that is also very relevant to that, uh, with the lightning bolt, uh, striking the tower, um, basically tearing it apart where you also see jumpers, um, falling down, right? Oh yes. Oh yes. And the, the tower card is associated pretty strongly with the, uh, Mars energy and the T or the, uh, the, the Tuesday, the God tier associated with the tier rune. But this is a, uh, an interesting one because it happened on a Tuesday, which is Tears Day, a day of war associated mm -hmm. with Mars. But yeah, absolutely the same symbol. The tower breaks down, and that could represent your persona, your ego, your conceptions yeah. of the world, and whatever remains is authentic. So the tower looks destructive and terrible, but it's getting rid of stuff you don't need. And you also mentioned the two pillars, uh, Hakim and Boaz, J and B. Those are featured on the Priestess card, which we hadn't mentioned going over yeah. but it has it right there j and b white and black which interestingly i see this show up frequently in the archetypes or the characters of batman and robin and the white face paint the black mask b i'm sorry batman and joker mm -hmm. uh, b and j mm -hmm. joker representing like the underworld the lower class batman is this rich guy you know but the whole point of it is we see this duality throughout all these various psyops and it all goes back to the same body of symbols and this basic black and white duality is really what underpins all of the psyops which are basically about splitting us in two and it is it is a verifiable uh, fact at least from my experience uh, and you could um, could tell us uh, yours uh, as well but from my experience it is a verifiable fact that 911 was indeed uh, to me an enlightenment um, event because that is basically what started um, not started but really 
um, did uh, a, a major impulse into um, my journey of, of figuring out reality, of looking into reality from a different perspective. Um, so uh, I have discussed in, in one of my videos, one of my earlier videos even, the, um, the fact that it seems to me that 9-11 uh, was um, at least from a, a deeper understanding, uh, an initiatory uh, world event, wouldn't you say? You know, interestingly, it is the New Year's Day on the Coptic calendar, and many have convincingly argued that this could be the birthday of Christ, which is also interesting. But was this event a, a, uh, a paradigm shock for many? I think so. I think it traumatized a lot of people and pushed them deeper into the matrix. But a lot mm -hmm. of people, it had the opposite effect. And I know for me, I was uh, aware, I, I was aware that what was being presented wasn't a hundred percent. There was too much in the subtext. And on that day, even then I was noting a lot of, and a lot of stuff was bubbling up online. A lot of, uh, we had considered to be the conspiratorial viewpoints. Now, a lot of those were obviously led by controlled opposition, but the doubts were there and it had a lot of people looking. And I think what ended up happening is they created what I consider to be almost like tantamount to a crucifixion, um, a contemporary mm -hmm. myth. They changed the whole world with this one event. Oh, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and the effects were, like you said, uh, disparate, which could uh, bring us to even consider that it was a sort of uh, quoting uh, um, that passage in the Bible of uh, separating the wheat uh, from the chaff, right? Um, uh, where the reading um, that you would take from that event uh, would be either on the side of uh, pushing you further into a fearful kind of reality, fearful perception of reality, because it is based on perception, uh, or um, releasing a bit of that fear, which is basically what you've been doing with uh, the IPS, right? Uh, uh, releasing um, or trying to present the, the, the fakery uh, in order to release that stress that fear, that anxiety that may come if you consider these, um, these events to be real. Oh, sure. In fact, in our previous conversation, you had, mm -hmm. we had discussed this, kind of got into this topic, and I think we got into death a little bit. And I think what yeah. we're looking at here is, in initiatory societies, you have to overcome your fear of death. You do a simulated death. And you had mentioned how uh, subconsciously, there may not be, your, your subconscious may not perceive that its death is merely symbolic, that it can actually fear like a person, mm -hmm. its own end. And I think that facing and overcoming that that fake death, that um, I guess it'd be something of a transformative awakening if you go through with it, but fear keeps a lot of people from giving up on certain things or from reaching certain conclusions. And I think fear is the primary thing that holds this worldview in place, to be quite honest, whether it's fear of the consensus or fear of whatever uh, scary spectacle they give us. But, you know, the death card itself, which is a very important card in the Tarot, um, it mm -hmm. really suggests transformation, that death is merely like the, sh the scorpion shedding its exoskeleton that it outgrew. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, uh, well, death in, in the um, uh, psychological or spiritual sense, uh, what I've come to realize is that uh, it is, in fact, like you've mentioned before, a change of persona. And the problem uh, that usually arises with, um, with the personas is that uh, there is a, a certain um, amount of ego identification with a persona being worn, and that is healthy up to a certain point because we need to deal with society. So these personas help us within the context uh, to you know, contact with others and live a, a regular, let's say, um, a fruitful life um, through that persona that sort of hides and uh, uh, even guards uh, the ego from a direct uh, contact, let's say, a contact that could be uh, problematic. Uh, the issue there is when it inverts. So the persona becomes um, so, or the ego becomes so identif identified with the persona that it uh, mistakes one for the other and considers that the persona is the self. Uh, 